and had his early diplomatic uh, assignments in New Delhi, Vienna, Brussels, and Edinburgh, where he served as Ireland's first Consul General from 1998 to 2001. He served as Ireland's ambassador to Malaysia, where he was also accredited to Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam, and after that as Ireland's ambassador to Germany. Before arriving in Washington as Ireland's 18th ambassador to the United States in 2017, Dan Mulhall served as ambassador in London for four years. Towards the end of his uh, term in the UK, he was made a freeman of the city of London in recognition of his work as ambassador. And in 2017, he received an honorary doctorate from the University of Liverpool. Now, during his diplomatic career, Ambassador Mulhall has also held a number of positions in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, including Director General for European Affairs. Uh, he served as a member of the Secretariat of the Forum for Peace and Reconciliation, and um, he was the department's press councillor, in which capacity he was part of the Irish government's delegation at the critical moment of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998. Now, on top of all of that, um, Ambassador Mulhall, as many of you know, is an accomplished public intellectual. He's the author of A New Day Dawning, a portrait of Ireland in 1900, and co-editor of The Shaping of Modern Ireland, The Centenary Assessment. As a writer and an intellectual, um, he's an advocate in some ways a pioneer of public uh, diplomacy using social media, at Dan Mulhall, uh, <laughs> lively uh, blog posts to disseminate insights into the work of the embassy uh, to promote knowledge of Irish history and literature to engage with Irish people, those of Irish descent around the world. Uh, in other words, um, to be a diplomat in the most um, culturally accomplished uh, sense. So welcome, Ambassador Mohan. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you Kevin, uh, for that uh, warm welcome. I'm glad to be back here. I, I, I spoke here last year on Squelga, and I'm delighted that enough people um, um, understood what I was saying to invite me back again to uh, deliver this lecture in English, which I'm happy to do. Although, if you want me to switch to Irish at any time, please put your hand up. I'll do my best. Um, okay. But um, no, I, um, I, um, wherever I go in the world, I always, um, I always approach my assignment through the the lens of history because, you know, I tend to, before I go further to Germany, I bought a lot of books about Germany, I read a lot, and in Germany, of course, you, you can't avoid modern history, it's all around you, in Berlin especially, but also in other parts of Germany. And when I went to Britain, of course, I, you know, it's, London's a very historic city, and, and you can't avoid, again, um, immersing yourself in, in the history as a kind of a, and I find history is just the best way of, uh, of getting to know a country. Um, because you know, you, it gives you a three-dimensional view of the country, and then you can fill in the gaps. You can you, you can um, fill in the picture um, when you're there, uh, living and working in the particular country. So when I came to the United States, I I looked at my at my library, and I found that I had an extraordinary number of books on American history. I just somehow over the years I didn't know I was ever going to end up in the United States. Like I thought I would not end up here because. Having been in London, I thought that was probably it, and I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't um, ever get a chance to serve in the United States. But uh, it happened for me, and I then collected my books together and discovered that I had a, a library, really, of books on the United States and the history of, the, of America, and I've added to that library very considerably over the last two years. And also, when you travel around the United States, even though it's a young country, there's a lot of respect for heritage here. and. Uh, Earlier this year, I visited the um, um, University of Virginia. And when you're there, of course, I also visited Monticello and I visited Montpellier, the home of James Madison. And of course, you can't help but 
think about the American Declaration of Independence. So in my visit to um, Jefferson's home and to the UVA campus, I started thinking about the Declaration of Independence. And I, I had this, this thought came to me that the American Declaration of Independence and the American Revolution is, is universally celebrated. It's one of these great events in world history. And nobody, nobody thinks it was a bad idea. I mean, I don't think you would find anybody anywhere in the world who thinks, no, America should really have stayed loyal. Uh, the crowd. Um, but our revolution, on the other hand, is much more contested space. It's, uh, you know, there's a consensus, obviously, in Ireland that it was a very good thing. But there are people in Ireland who are critical of our revolution. So I got to start thinking about, well, maybe as a historian, as an ambassador, I should compare the two processes and I should try to um, explore um, the, the parallels and the differences, because there are major differences between those two great events. So it is a, an honor to be here, to be asked to deliver this year's Ernie O'Malley Lecture. And I want to thank the team at Luxman Ireland House for inviting me to be this year's speaker, and to Cormac O'Malley, who sadly is not here, for supporting this annual event in memory of his distinguished father. In fact, I was, uh, I, I met him, uh, the, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wearing a badge given to me by uh, about 20 veterans of the Second Battalion Association, who were over here for Veterans Day, and they were all dressed in their wonderful um, uh, green, uh, 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 dark green blazers, and they also gave me a set of cufflinks, which I decided immediately to wear, because of course, I'm talking about the origins of of Ireland's uh, Contemporary Defence Force. It was great to meet these people today at the concert. But I want to say that, um, in a way, the topic I have today, which is uh, this evening, which is the independence process in Ireland, and comparing with the American one, Ernie O'Malley is actually a, quite a, an important figure when it comes to understanding that period in our history. Because his story, which he recounts in his book, On Another Man's Wound, in a way, it parallels the story of Ireland between 1914 and 1922. If you start in January 1914, most Irish people would have been happy with home rule. Had home rule been, been, been granted in, had home rule become law in January, February, or March of 1914. In fact, when the home rule bill was passed in 1914, it was w widely and enthusiastically welcomed in Ireland. <coughs> People thought it was a great thing that we'd have finally achieved Home Rule after 40 years of the Home Rule Party in, in, uh, in Westminster struggling against all the odds to deliver Home Rule. Finally delivered in 1940. Had it been implemented at that time, most people in Ireland would have said, yeah, that's, that's what we wanted and, and we're happy with it. By 19... 18, nobody, or almost nobody in nationalist Ireland was happy with Home Rule. So 1914, most people are saying Home Rule is fine. By 1918, there's a determination, and in the years that followed, to insist on an independent Irish Republic to be gained by force of arms. It's an extraordinary transformation. And Ernie O'Malley, in a way, epitomizes that transformation because, and in his book, he, he talks about, because um, he went from being a, a medical student at Trinity College in 1916, initially was against the Rising, then joined the uh, Rising, and became a Republican warrior for the next seven or eight years of his life. And he, he talks about how his book, he says, is, I quote, the background of the struggle from 1916 to 1921 between an empire and an unarmed people. Now, that wasn't quite right because, of course, they did have some arms. He was one who certainly, uh, you know, um, couldn't have been regarded as unarmed. And he describes himself, and again, he may be embroidering things a little bit here, but that's fair enough. If people are titled in, in, their, in their memoirs to be a little bit, um, you, know, um, you know, nostalgic. Um, he calls himself, I quote, a sheltered individual drawn from the secure seclusion of Irish life to the responsibility of action. Because he was from a family, his parents were, I suppose, moderate parliamentary nationalists who believed in home rule. He ends up as a, a very 
determined Irish Republic. How does that transformation occur? And what are the reasons why that transformation occurred? Now, as it happens, something similar happened in America in the 1760s and 1770s. Because if you turn the clock back to 1760, for example, America was a decidedly loyal part of the empire. Nobody in 1760 would have ever thought about the idea of independence for, for what? For 13 disparate colonies. And yet by 1776, America was a hotbed of revolution and demanding its independence and fighting for that independence against what was at that time the strongest empire in the world. So neither, in my view, neither the American nor the Irish revolutions were inevitable. There were, after all, many in America who remained loyal to the crown throughout the independence period, throughout the War of Independence. And some of them, I think there were about 80,000, 10,000 Americans, Americans fought for the British against independence in the United States. Again, uh, they fought for the British against American independence. And about 80,000 loyalists left this country. Many of them came back afterwards and settled here and you know, were reintegrated back in, but many, there were many who didn't come back because they couldn't accept American independence. Likewise, the Irish Revolution was not inevitable. In fact, the 1916 Rising was a bit of a, it appeared to many at the time, as a bolt from the blue. Because after all, it happened at a time when many Irishmen, some of them thoroughgoing nationalists, were actually fighting on the Western Front. And their families at home were receiving money generated by their menfolk who had enlisted for service in the First World War. So neither of the revolutions was really inevitable, but both of them happened. So what caused these transformations to occur? Now, the question in America really is, was the American Revolution the political embodiment of the Enlightenment ideas that Thomas Jefferson and others acquired in the period leading up to the revolution? Or was it caused by a mishmash of events which drove Americans towards ultimately, reluctantly, breaking the link with Britain? And in Ireland, we can ask, what role did ideals, nationalist ideology play as opposed to the opportunities that were presented by the circumstances that arose during the First World War, which convinced some within the nationalist community that this was the time to strike for independence. Now, the American Declaration of Independence was an epoch-making event in global history. It played a vital role in ushering in the modern era in which we still live. And the words that Jefferson wrote in that declaration's opening paragraph, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are about the most famous words in the political history of mankind. There are hardly any words that can compare. Maybe Lincoln's Gettysburg, Gettysburg Address, perhaps you could claim, might have some, um, it might, might provide some competition. On the other hand, Ireland's Declaration of Independence is hardly known at all. It was unfortunate, in a way, that the Declaration was issued on the 21st of January, 1919. And at the very same day, an ambush took place at Sonnethead Beck in County Tipperary, which is generally recognized to be the, the start, you know, the, the start of the War of Independence. So, in other words, the men of ideas producing a Declaration of Independence and other documents in Dublin that day were eclipsed by the, the activists in, in, um, uh, in, in Tipperary who ambushed a, uh, an RIC convoy and um, killed a couple of policemen and then made off with the weapons. So 
an unfortunate coincidence that the two things happened the same day. And we now think about the War of Independence. We almost forget that there was a Declaration of Independence that was issued that day. And for example, Ernie O'Malley briefly quotes from the Declaration in his book on another man's wounds, but doesn't really dwell on it. Doesn't make any comment about who wrote it, how it was written, where it was written, when it was written, nothing like that. Whereas we know practically everything about Jefferson's Declaration. Because, of course, at the time, maybe Jefferson and the others didn't think much of the Declaration, but by the time Jefferson died, he put on his tombstone, author of the Declaration of Independence. Didn't bother mentioning the fact that he was president of the United States, but that's another matter. Uh, perhaps, he, perhaps he knew how, um, how uh, the, you know, posterity would, you know, uh, uh, would revere the words he wrote. But he, but he recognized by the time he, he died that his words were, you know, were, were actually canonical. Okay. As I said, I mean, Robert Brennan, in his memoir of that period, Robert Brennan was the, um, the first Secretary General of, of the Department of Foreign Affairs and became head of mission in Washington between 1938 and 1947. He doesn't mention it at all in his memoir of the period, Allegiance. And, and you can look at a whole range of histories of that period and you'll struggle to find a reference to the Declaration. I think there are very good reasons for regarding the Declaration as more important than we give it credit for. And I'll, I'll explain that. Um, the reason for that, I think, is because the people who wrote that Declaration and who adopted it in Dublin on the 21st of January 1919, they were all democratically elected. So whereas you can argue that the proclamation of Easter 1916 was issued by people who had no mandate to issue such a declaration, such a proclamation, you can certainly, I think, be, be confident in saying that there was a mandate. Now, you can argue about the nature of the mandate and so forth, but there was certainly, they, those people had been elected by the people of Ireland in the first proper election ever held in Ireland because, of course, the franchise was much wider than it had been um, at any time in our past history. Now, the American Declaration, obviously, the ideas of the Enlightenment, and I, I just read a book there recently by Bernard Balin about the, the, um, the ideological roots of the American Revolution. And he makes it quite plain that, that there was a lot of Enlightenment ideas welling around America, not just Jefferson, but all kinds of obscure pamphleteers. Hundreds of pamphlets were written on various aspects that all paved the way for the declaration to be issued in, 19, uh, in, in 1776. But it seems to me that, that it's hard to imagine. Let's say there was never an enlightenment. It's hard to imagine that America would still be part of the British Empire. Right? In other words, it is hard to imagine that Britain could have kept control of America as it expanded <laughs> westwards towards the Pacific, as the population was transformed by immigration from all over the world, including from Ireland. In other words, my, my assessment is that what caused the American Revolution was not so much the Enlightenment ideas, which of course were, were vital because they gave expression to a set of ideals which became very important to Americans and indeed to the wider world. What's important was the distance. The distance from London to America was such that it was inevitable that sooner or later the colonies would have drifted away from Britain. And it's, it, it would be absurd to think that Britain could have, I mean, Washington could hardly rule America in the 19th century, the way the country was developing and moving, moving westward in the way it did. So America's history was shaped by westward expansion and by demographic change brought about by, you know, by immigration. But the key thing to remember is that the tensions that began with the Stamp Act of 1765, it took 11 years to produce enough fuel to create a willingness on the part of those who met in Philadelphia to declare independence from America. Now, um, 
the American Revolution, strangely, didn't. I mean, it was it was it was a it was a country, a political system, based on principles that had never before been applied anywhere in the world. And I'm sure at the time conservatives were fearful that these ideas would spread. They spread to France to some degree, but really nowhere else in Europe. And for example, between 1776 and 1918, apart from France, which declared a republic, then went back to being uh, an empire, then a republic, an empire, and so on, eventually ended up as a republic from 1870 onwards, apart from France, no other European country became a republic. In other words, the, the, the American formula for government didn't actually spread. It spread to Latin America, but I, what, I've, what I've been able to read about that was that Americans didn't really uh, rate the republics of, of, of Latin America. They saw them as being quite different in, in, in character. But in Europe, where you'd expect <coughs> these ideas to have taken root, they didn't take root. Why? Because European societies were very different from America. They were settled societies where monarchism was much more deeply entrenched. Now, the American Revolution had a huge effect on Ireland. As Roy Foster has put it in one of his books, quote, the radicalization of Irish political life was part of one great theme from the 1770s, the impact of America, end quote. And America, the American example led to the rise of colonial nationalism which morphed into republicanism in the 1790s and eventually gave rise to the rebellion, the rising of 1798. And the 1798 rising is actually the foundational moment in Irish nationalist history. Because before that, you had a very different political tradition. There was resistance to British rule through, but this was a much more concerted and ideologically based uh, opposition to British rule in Ireland. And for example, those who fought in 1916 and afterwards would have been very conscious of being in the tradition of Wolf Tone and Robert Emmons and so forth, tracing their roots back to the 1798 Rising. As Sean McEntee, who took part in the Easter Rising and became a minister in the Fianna Fáil government in the 50s, 60s, and 30s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, he said that without Wolf Tone, quote, there might not have been a rising and almost certainly not a Republic of Ireland. So the point I make is that in Ireland there was a, a long tradition which by the time we became independent in the 1920s, and by the time the declaration was issued in 1919, had a history that was more than a century old. Whereas the American one, they had to invent something in a 10 year period. A very different type of experience. And also, of course, the aftermath of the 1798 rebellion tells you another story. It's the opposite, it's the reverse of the coin of what happened in America. In America, the colonists were saved by distance. The British were too far away to be able to impose their will on the 13 colonies. And eventually they had to give up. America was also aided by the role played by France, the other great power in Europe at that time. In Ireland, the proximity killed any chance that the rising of 1798 could have succeeded. Because Ireland was, was, was so close to Britain that its, its freedom efforts, its efforts to break away were not going to succeed because the overwhelming power that Britain could bring to bear on Ireland. And throughout the 19th century, that was the key factor. There were quite a few uprisings, um, campaigns against tides, campaigns in favor of land reform, and so forth. But none of these efforts could counter the reality that the British power was too strong and near at hand, and therefore not possible for, for the native Irish to, to stand up to that power, whereas the Americans could do that because they were so much further away. The other factor, of course, in, in, the, in the Irish case was that 
there was a loyal community in Ireland and they were concentrated in the northeast of Ireland. It was a very important factor in my view. In America, there were loyalists. As I mentioned, there were 80,000 people left the Americas, but they were scattered all over the country. And they didn't have the critical mass anywhere in any of the 13 colonies to block the movement towards independence. So, and of course, but this, so this sustained resistance to British rule in Ireland just wasn't able to produce any outcome for Ireland because of the its proximity to Britain and the determination and the fact that Britain regarded Ireland as intrinsic to imperial security. And therefore, and you know, when I hear people talk about Daniel O'Connell and, the, and the, the, mass, you know, the monster meeting at Clontarf and some, some Republicans, some people in the nationalist um, point of view or the strongly nationalist viewpoint say O'Connell missed a trick. He should have um, stood up against the British in Clontarf. Well, if you, if you see what the British were willing, what the British government was willing to do domestically in the 1830s and 40s to crush any dissent, you can just imagine what it would have been like uh, had that monster meeting gone ahead against the wishes of the British government. I remember reading about the Great Reform Act of 1832 and reading a great, an interesting line from Duke of Wellington, who, who when he was Prime Minister, assured um, Her Majesty, uh, was it his Majesty? I'm not sure which, uh, his, uh, Her Majesty, yeah, he assured her that, that um, well, uh, you know, the people of Britain are, are very, um, you know, they will ultimately obey you know, the rules, but if they don't, we know how to deal with them. So my point is that, that Ireland was really up against it from the point of view of the you know, disparity of power between uh, Britain and Ireland at that time. Now, um, the 1916 proclamation is actually, I think, a very impressive document, and, you know, it, it, has, it has a ring to it, and I think it's all down to the influence of Patrick Pierce, in the name of God and the dead generations from which he receives our old traditions of nationhood, Ireland through us summons her children to her flag and strikes for her freedom. So if Ireland had a Thomas Jefferson, it was probably Patrick Pierce. I know he's criticized sometimes for the sort of sanguinary um, you know, rhetoric, but actually, if you read Jefferson, some of what Jefferson said as well had the same ideas in it of, you know, the, the you know the soil needs to be manured with the blood of patriots and so forth. So, you know, I mean, 120 years later, Pierce wasn't the only one ever to speak, you know, in those terms. And Jefferson also did. Jefferson was in favor, for example, of the execution of Louis XVI, because he felt that, that he had come to him and that every, every noble and every priest should be strung up to the nearest gallows. I mean, that was, you know, Jefferson, people sometimes, you know, um, can romanticize uh, figures from the 18th century, but they were, you know, Jefferson wasn't a great fighter, and nor was Pierce, to be quite clear, but he was quite, willing to, you know, to use language that we might now see as a bit over the top when it comes to <laughs> urging violence, like others. Anyway, I'm, 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 not, I'm not being critical of Jefferson because, I mean, obviously what he did was a fantastic piece of work. But, so, um, so my point then is that, that Patrick Pierce's embrace of Gaelic revivalism provided a spur to revolution in Ireland in ways not dissimilar from the impact of the Enlightenment on the 18th century America. And for example, I go back to Robert Brennan in his book Allegiance. Now, he was actually a very representative figure in many ways. He rose to the top, Secretary General of the Department of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador in Washington, well, um, that, that I suppose is somewhere near the top anyway, I don't know about that. Well, it wasn't those days anyway, maybe not now, I don't know. Um, and now, he was a leading light, he was a founder member of the Gaelic League in Wexford, right? Number one. When Sinn Féin was established by Arthur Griffith, he joined uh, Sinn Féin. And then later on, he was sworn into the IRB by Sean T. O'Kelly, who was an IRB organizer around the country. So he was in the three big movements that created the momentum that brought about Irish independence in the second decade, in the second and third decades of the 20th century. And what he wrote was, he said, in the late 19th century, and I quote, Ireland's ancient culture was forgotten 
and debased English standards had taken its place. The political destinies of the nation were in the hands of the warring factions of what had once been the great Irish Parliamentary Party, whose members had now become mere tools of the British Liberal Party. End quote. Like many of his generation, Brendan gave credit to the Gaelic League, and he said it had set loose forces that were to, and I quote, tear down the mighty and seemingly everlasting pillars of an alien civilization and set up in its place an Ireland in line with its ancient Gaelic culture. Now, of course, that didn't happen, but, you know, not everything that Jefferson wrote about in his various documents happened either, or at least not for a long time. So the point I'm making is that this kind of idealism was an important part of the Irish revolutionary moment. I'm not saying it caused the revolution, just like I'm not saying enlightenment ideas caused the revolution here, because you needed the interplay of ideology and circumstance, opportunity, the opportunity being the First World War, and the upheavals caused by the First World War was akin to the upheavals caused in the aftermath in America of the um, of what was called the French and Indian Wars in this country. So, let me just... Um, now, the American Declaration is very interesting because it's famous for the lines that I quoted at the beginning. But actually, those lines are not in any way representative of the document. So, Jefferson's text, if you read it, in its entirety, and most people probably don't, because the body of it is more like a lawyerly list of grievances against the English king. There's a beautiful piece at the beginning, and there's stuff at the end which is quite strong, but in between, it's like a laundry list of the terrible things that the king of England has done to, uh, to America. So for example, in the opening paragraph, before the famous lines I quoted, he says that when there is a need to dissolve established political bonds, it is necessary, and I quote, to declare the causes which impel them to the separation. In other words, we have to provide true cause. We can't just break away from, from England. We have to actually prove our case, almost like in court. And he said, and then in the main body of the declaration, there's a list of what he calls King George's, quote, history of repeated injuries and usurpations, which had led to, quote, an absolute tyranny over the colony. So, and then he goes on to list these things, and the grievances include 27 points in all, right? Charges of refusing to assent to laws, dissolving representative colonial assemblies, obstructing the administration of justice, interfering with the independence of judges, keeping standing armies in place in times of peace and cutting off the colonies' trade with the rest of the world. So in other words, England had a lot to answer for, according to Jefferson. But of course, one of the problems is that, that America was not an oppressed set of colonies in the 18th century. In fact, it was doing very well. But Americans became convinced that the British crown and the British establishment was trying to undermine their liberties and put them into a kind of a condition of slavery. And that was why um, they felt the need uh, to break free. And actually, he says that King George III is unfit, I quote, unfit to be the ruler of a free people. In other words, we're a free people. We've been free for ages. We're part of this English-British nation. And now we're being told we're no longer free. We're being put upon by this king in England, and we have to break away. And the upshot of all of this was that he said, these United Colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent. Now, the Irish Declaration was a very different type of document. Because unlike um, Jefferson's Declaration, there was absolutely no need to make a long laundry list of grievances against the British Crown. Let me just tell you what he did do. Now, and remember, um, Jefferson was very loyal. In fact, I have a quote here, which I, I won't skip over, but it's an important quote. And he said that he wrote it in 1775. This was out at the time of Concord in Lexington. 
Jefferson wrote that he would, quote, rather be independent on Great Britain, properly limited, than on any nation upon earth, or on no nation. In other words, he preferred to be under the domination of Britain than either under the domination of any other nation or no nation. So this is not rabid um, republicanism on the part of Jefferson. It was something that evolved over time. It took 11 years. On the other hand, the 1918 election, which saw the triumph of Sinn Féin over the, over the Parliamentary Party in all parts of nationalist Ireland, the Parliamentary Party held on to a few seats, but only because Sinn Féin didn't contest them. And the results were declared on the 28th of December, 1918. On the 2nd of January, 1919, the Sinn Féin headquarters in Harcourt Street, which is now the headquarters of the Cumberland Guelga, issued a letter to all those elected saying, meet next week in Dublin. Now, they didn't meet for another two weeks. But nonetheless, between the actual election results and the Declaration of Independence, we had 24 days. So this is whirlwind stuff. That's why we don't know who wrote the Declaration of Independence in Ireland's case. Because it all happened in a kind of a, a mad frenzy. Now, I, I, have my, you know, I have my theory, which I'll give you in a second. So in, instead, of the, instead of the laundry list of, of complaints against Britain, our Declaration says, whereas for 700 years the Irish people has never ceased to repudiate and has repeatedly protested in arms against foreign usurpation. End quote. English rule in Ireland was described as, quote, based upon force and fraud and maintained by military occupation against the declared will of the people. So straightforward. It was the 700 years of British rule. That was enough. There was no need to go through this long recitation of detailed complaints against Britain. This was a, a straightforward declaration of independence. So in other words, no need to go into a detail, a pithy reference to British rule in Ireland would be sufficient to justify breaking away. So the members of the First Dáil pledged themselves, and I quote, to make this declaration effective by every means at our command. This is a brave thing to do. So remember, two thirds of those elected were in jail at the time, including Robert Brennan. Um, he, 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 he was in jail. Uh, in Britain. And they were facing, let's face it, they were up against a power, the British Empire, that had just won the most, the bloodiest war in human history and had demonstrated a degree of ruthlessness in the comments of that war, which, you know, ought to have made people at that time rather, rather worried, rather wary of what they might have been able to do in Ireland. So it was a brave thing to do, it's just like it was a brave thing were those in Philadelphia in 1776, because again, they were up against a very successful empire, which was very likely, as it did, come and try to bloody the noses of the independence um, movement and its supporters. So, and that's, of course, well, what I've said there about, about you know, that, that's similar to Jefferson's text. Jefferson's text says, and for the support of this declaration, with firm reliance on protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. So both declarations conclude with this commitment to doing everything necessary to achieve this, achieve the goals of these declarations. Echoing the American Declaration again, its Irish counterpart insisted that only the elected representatives of the Irish people had the right to make laws binding on the Irish people. Very similar to what Jefferson was saying in his declaration. And also, of course, there was a demand for the evacuation of what was called the English garrison in Ireland, akin to what Jefferson would have wanted in the 18th century. So while there was no soaring passage to match Jefferson's um, evocation of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the Irish Declaration does contain an aspirational agenda, quote, to promote the common weal, to re-establish justice, and to constitute a national policy based upon the people's will with equal rights and equal opportunities for every citizen. So it's a, pretty, it's a pretty good liberal sort of affirmation of what the revolution was seeking to do. Um, so the declaration was accompanied by two other documents, which in themselves have overshadowed the Declaration of Independence, which was kind of taken for granted. That was really 
seen as a reiteration of the proclamation of 1916. And those declarations were, or those documents were an address to the free nations of the world and the democratic program. And the address is aimed unmistakably at an American audience because it describes Ireland as the gateway to the Atlantic. That was clearly aimed at the overseas Irish. It goes on to point, that, point out that, quote, Ireland is the last outpost of Europe to the West. Ireland is the point upon which great trade routes between East and West converge. In other words, it was asserting Ireland's role as an Atlantic country, akin to the United States. The address led to the dispatch of a delegation to the Versailles Conference, and although they had strong Irish-American support, they couldn't get a hearing for Ireland's claims, and that's probably the reason why the War of Independence took off in the way it did, because it clearly convinced people that it wouldn't be possible by persuasion, even though Ireland's case was clearly in line with, 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 with the principles that uh, President Wilson had set out um, uh, you know, uh, the year before. So, now, while the composition of the American Declaration is a storied event, the origins of its Irish equivalent are a mystery. It was written in a rush between December 28th, 1918, and 21st of January, 1919. According to the nationalist historian Dorothy McCardle, um, the documents approved by the first Dáil were composed by a committee consisting of the lawyer, George Gavin Duffy, who had been the defence lawyer for Roger Casement, at his trial for treason in 1916, um, and was part of the team that negotiated later on, the team that negotiated uh, the Treaty of 1921, the End of Irish Treaty, and was briefly Ireland's first foreign minister. The second person involved was the writer Piers Beasley, who was a, an Irish language writer, uh, born in Liverpool, but a, but a very strong Irish language uh, writer, and, and then the political activist, Sean T. O'Kelly. Now, of the three, my, given that the declaration was issued in three languages, French, Irish, and English, my guess is that the Irish version was written by Beasley, who was an Irish, who was a strong Irish scholar. That the French version was written by George Gavin Duffy because he lived part of his life in France and presumably spoke quite good French. And that the English version was written by Sean T. O'Kelly. That would be my guess. Although, funny enough, nowhere in any of the literature have I found any evidence. It is, it is, it is clear that O'Kelly rewrote the Democratic Program. The Democratic Program was drafted first by the leader of the Labour Party. Uh, and it was regarded by those in time, they, and they wanted the Labour Party to support the independence uh, movement, but they didn't want to go too far down the line of being socialist and being criticised by the church for being uh, excessively radical. So um, Johnson, the Labour Party leader's text, was rewritten <coughs> by Sean T. O'Kelly. So we know that he was involved in rewriting that, and my guess is that he probably wrote the Declaration of Independence. Now, um, now, like Jefferson, of course he doesn't, can't compare with Jefferson, he's no Jefferson, clearly, but he did go on to occupy some of the most senior posts in 20th century Ireland. President, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Finance, during a very long political career. And the key thing is, just like Jefferson <coughs> in 1776, O'Kelly was in his 30s when he wrote the Declaration, if I'm right in my conclusion that he did write it. So what you have here is a young generation of people throwing off the shackles of the, the older funny duddies who weren't prepared to take this bold step and being bold and brave. Jefferson in 1770s, O'Kelly and his um, uh, contemporaries in 1919. Now, the, obviously, neither declaration led to an immediate uh, independence for either America in the 1770s or for Ireland in, in, in 1919, but both struggles took a number of years. In the American case, it took seven years to achieve independence. In the Irish case, it took another three years, say, from 1990 to 1922. And of course, you know, there were very, very different struggles because while in America you had a, a struggle that was, um, uh, you know, there was, there was sort of, it was an 18th century type struggle with, with, with um, you know, with people, um, you know, with armies, recognizable armies on both sides, okay, 
the British one more disciplined, the American one less so. But nonetheless, both led by by people who knew how to fight uh, wars. Obviously, the Irish one was very different. It was a guerrilla warfare. It was the 20th, 20th century, one of the first 20th century uh, guerrilla warfares. Um, other countries clearly took um, uh, to the key to what happened in Ireland and, 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 and followed the Irish example. Um, in the Irish case, of course, it led to a civil war within within three years of the within three and a half years of the uh, Declaration of Independence. Ireland was was embroiled in a civil war, uh, but like America, which of course its civil war was much later, um, but like America, Ireland against all the odds. I mean, who would have said in the 1770s even Americans, a lot of them didn't think America could survive because this had never been done before. There was a lot of alarm and you had John Adams and others, some of the Federalists, wanting to create a monarchy because that was the only form of government that they thought was really viable. So, um, in the Irish case, um, the success of the Irish Revolution was not made in 1922, it was made in 1932, when you had a, a transfer of power from those who had lost the civil, from those who had won the civil war, to those who had lost it, and from, to me at least, Ireland, independent Ireland, proved itself on that day in 1932 when power was peacefully transferred from those bitter rivals of 10 years before. So, the other thing, of course, about America, which is different from Ireland, a lot of the founding fathers of the Irish Revolution didn't survive. I mean, you think about it. The 16, they weren't all leaders, but certainly some of them were people of of, of quality. Without Pierce would have been would have been quite an interesting cabinet minister in, in a nineteen in independent Ireland. MacDonough would have been probably a very good education minister or whatever. And you know, so there were there was enough talent, a lot of talent there. Alfred Griffith didn't survive either. Many people lost their lives in the Civil War, the War of Independence. Monty Collins didn't survive. So you know there was a lot of a lot of losses sustained. In the American case, actually the longevity of the founding fathers of America is really quite striking. And it did certainly give America an opportunity to settle itself down after the, the um, upheavals of the 1770s and 1780s. But it wasn't without its difficulties. You know, the, the competition between Adams's vision of America and Jefferson's vision became quite, uh, uh, quite nasty in the late uh, 18th century. And it took a while for that, uh, for that um, turbulence to, you know, to quieten down. So, the world of the 1770s in which America emerged as an independent nation was very different from the post-First World War era in which Ireland declared its independence. The American Declaration came at the beginning of a new era in the world history, which was instrumental in creating. Irish independence came at the end of that era, as war and revolution remade the world at Versailles, just as the Treaty of Paris did 136 years earlier. The long 19th century between the American and Russian revolutions was a period during which Ireland developed a distinctive national political identity with demands for self-government couched in various terms and pursued by different means, but always unsuccessfully until the First World War provided the, provided the opportunity for Ireland to become independent. In the second half of the 19th century, America became a factor in Irish politics as post-famine Irish immigrants and their descendants supported Irish movements at home. British concern about the capacity of Irish America to complicate UK-US relations, which were vital to Britain at the time, played a major part, in my view, in the UK decision to concede independence to Ireland. The Irish and American revolutions, separated by 140 years, were similar in a number of respects. They succeeded because in both cases, the Metropolitan Government made important missteps and they fatally underestimated their opponents. In the very different circumstances in which they operated, both sets of revolutionaries exhibited tenacity and determination, which eventually saw them triumph against the odds of power politics. Ireland's declaration is clearly a cousin of its American counterpart. Even the choice of title seems to me to suggest that a conscious comparison was being sought to be made between the two. Our declaration was also the heir to a rich vein of nationalist thought 
from Wolf Tone in the 1790s to Robert Emmett in 1803, the Ireland in the 1840s, and the Fenian movement in the 1860s. Plus the many Irish parliamentarians at Westminster who kept the flame of Irish independence, a separate Irish political entity, alive through those dark decades of the 19th century. I do not expect the Irish Declaration of Independence ever to acquire the iconic status enjoyed by Jefferson's masterwork, but in my view, it ought to be better known than it is. Thank you very much. make that break. The very fact that even after Lexington and Concord, even after shots had been fired, and people had been killed, there still wasn't an absolute determination. In the Irish case, because of that tradition, my own view is that while Home Rule would just about have, have done the trick in 1914, by 1918, even if there hadn't been an Easter Rising, I believe that Home Rule would not have been sufficient. For our, I think that there was a, there was there was just about a, a willingness to say Home Rule was okay, you know, we'll go for it because that was thought to be all that was available. By 1918, a different vista had opened up, and a quite and that was all to do, in my view, with the tradition of nationalist resistance and the ideology of, of nationalism that had survived in different forms throughout the 19th century. But I must do that uh, comparison. You know. Okay. Thanks very much for that great presentation. Have you ever looked at Cornwallis's uh, success in America, uh, lack of success in America, yes. and his uh, relative success in Ireland? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think in, 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 in the text that I, I'll, I'll, I think it's maybe published at some stage, I, I do have a reference to Cornwallis. I skipped it over. I skipped over it in, in, in the, uh, my presentation. But it's all to do with distance. When I first went to Australia uh, in when was it? 1985, wasn't it? Yeah. I was there for two years. Um, and the first book I ever read was by a man called Geoffrey Blaney. And he became controversial afterwards, but uh, at that time he was a well known historian in Melbourne. And he wrote a book called The Tyranny of Distance. It was basically how Australian history was conditioned by distance from everything, but particularly from Europe. It was this place set apart. And I think the same is true. Uh, for America. As I said in the early part of my talk, I just can't, can't believe that had there been no French and Indian War, had there been no enlightenment, that America would have continued to be willing to be ruled from Britain. I just think that the distance and the different circumstances, I mean, people in Britain just couldn't fathom America. They looked down their nose at America in the way they looked down their nose at Ireland as well. And they realized in both cases that, that their opponents were stronger than they had imagined. They were stronger in America because they were distant. They were stronger in Ireland because the Irish, by the 20th century, were able to appeal to a community of Irish sentiment around the world. And it was very difficult to impose, you know, I mean, obviously, if Britain had wanted to, if you could win the First World War by slaughtering millions of, by millions of people being slaughtered on the Western Front, you could certainly defeat the Irish independence movement, but the will to do it was not there. The will to do it was there in the, in the 18th century when Cornwallis 
was sent to Ireland to, to put down the rising with a degree of, of savagery, a degree of um, uh, violence, which, which left a stain, actually, on Irish history thereafter. But by the 20th century, there simply wasn't sufficient uh, willingness to take, those, to take those draconian steps, as there would have been, in my view, any time in the 19th century. But by the 20th century, that will have been lost. Yes? Any more? Over here, in the corner. <laughs> oh. Anybody else? Yes? Why, um, can you address Canada? Why did Canada not, at the same time, with America doing what America you know, was doing, why, why did This is about Canada. You know, uh, why didn't Canada break away? Now, when I was writing this paper, I had some Canadian friends, a former Canadian ambassador, staying with me. And I asked him that question, he didn't know. He didn't know. He just, I mean, strangely enough, I found it a, a, really, in a way, unusual and a bit shocking that an ambassador for Canada, who had been an ambassador in a number of places around the world, very distinguished, retired now, friend of ours from one of our postings, just didn't, wasn't able to give me an answer. He was sort of like, almost like, like, why would you ask that question? I asked the question many times, and I don't know what the answer. I, but I, but I, I suspect it had to do with the fact that 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 simply Canada Canadians felt, well, I suppose you had the divisions in Canada between French speakers and English speakers, and therefore they felt a need to be more connected with the home, with the mother country, in order to prevent any French influence from creeping in and re-establishing, uh, you know, a presence in Canada. I, that's my only guess, but I don't know. It's a, it is a puzzle because you would expect that the same conditions apply in Canada, more or less, the same conditions apply. And yet it wasn't until the Fenians invaded Canada right. in 1866 right. that the Canadians decided, maybe we better establish a country here to stop these Irish from coming in. I actually visited the, uh, I visited the memorial at Buffalo um, with uh, a Senator um, Kennedy, Senator Tim Kennedy uh, from Buffalo, a local New York uh, state senator. He's a great man and a very proud Irish American. And we visited, I could see how close Canada was. You could, you could almost have swum across, you could almost, you could almost have a swim across the river. Uh, but, and of course, a thousand or so Fenians did cross. That was a madcap idea, of course, the idea that you could conquer Canada and then barter Canada for Ireland. But you know, what I'm say is, what I'm say is you know, God love them for their efforts, you know? <laughs> yes? So, uh, Canada became the Yes. So, I'm actually struck by the, by the fact that there was not, there was not the, um, the culture, the feeling, the whatever, the strength that would have been required for, for England to say, yeah, we're coming back. This is ours. We're going we're gonna to keep it. Well, you mean in America? No. In Ireland? That, 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 yeah, that, that, uh, you know, that the British would not have come back. I mean, I, and, and I think of today, for example, um, uh, I know it's completely, completely different, but, but, I, but I think of, of <coughs> Russia going in and taking Crimea. I think yeah. of Russia taking Ukraine. I think of, you know, I, I think of there is the willingness uh, you know, sometimes to yeah. go back in and take it. And so I'm kind of struck by the fact that after all that history and all that time, you know, the British said, oh, I guess we're done. Well, I mean, I suppose you could say the same thing about India, about, um, you know, the colonies in Africa and so on. I mean, okay, Ireland was more intrinsic, if you like, right. to Britain's interests close by and so on. So yeah, I suppose the question is, the question is really, why did Britain, why was Britain willing to leave Ireland in 1921-22 and not then try to come back, as it tried to do in a sense in America when, when the, the War of 1815 was, I suppose it wasn't an effort to reconquer, it was an effort to certainly teach the Americans a lesson, which failed. Um, so the question really is, is, why did Britain just wash its hands of Ireland after independence in 1922? My, my guess is, well, first of all, it's because it would have been impossible for a country like Britain in the 1920s or 30s to have, you know, behave like that. Secondly, it would have driven Irish Americans around the bend and England would have paid a huge price and couldn't have afforded that price when they were trying to curry favor with the United States. And also, I don't think they really, maybe, maybe the 1930s, uh, 
with the treaty ports in, in the Second World War, they might have momentarily thought about, about invading. But again, I think the cost of doing it would have been such that it would have outweighed any benefit that they would have gained from it. But I, I certainly, I must keep an eye on my British colleagues from now on. When I was in London, some people, you know, there were people who had a nostalgic kind of view of, well, really, you know, we should never have separated and so on. But it wasn't a kind of an aggressive one. It was more a nostalgic kind of, you know, wasn't it a shame that that happened and so forth. You know, I, I, I think... No, we're independent, and we stay that way. <laughs> okay. Is there, one, is there one more question or, or not? No, I don't get it. Thank you very much. So you had a little preview of the photo album of Ireland uh, playing in the background behind um, Ambassador Long Hall. So I, on behalf of Cormac O'Malley, um, Who's watching? Yes. <laughs> um, I'm going to read some of his remarks. He'd like to thank you, especially for delivering the 21st uh, annual Ernie O'Malley Lecture. Um, and he says, now this evening we have a second treat for you, which is the American launch of the photo album of the Irish. Ambassador Mulhall has been a great supporter of this effort and has kindly written the forward to the book. Included in this volume is a very different side of the military, Ernie O'Malley, a glimpse that goes beyond the public figure to reveal something of the private man. The photo album of the Irish is a digital archive project that celebrates the ordinary and extraordinary histories of people with Irish heritage around the world. It is organized by the Gallery of Photography in Dublin, and it taps into a hidden resource, family photograph albums, and makes them accessible online in exhibitions and in publications such as the one um, that is being launched this evening. Cormac became, this is I, but uh, Cormac became involved with this venture several years ago when co-curators of the gallery photographer, Tanya uh, Kyung and Trish Lamb, came to work on um, my extensive photographic archives of Ernie O'Malley and his wife, Helen Hooker O'Malley, in my Connecticut home. I wish I had a home in Connecticut. <laughs> uh, these energetic ladies spread out to other Irish American centers in Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, and elsewhere to collect images for this album, and many representatives of the families they met are here this evening with us. The photo album also includes pages on uh, Cormac's wife's Kennedy family, as well as that of Erskine Childers. This book intersects history and genealogy through treasured snapshots and portraits of loved ones. As Ambassador Mulhall writes, it reminds us of the millions of individual stories that comprise Irish America. The gallery has asked me to thank all the contributors and their extended families, Ambassador Mel Hall for his foreword, and Sean O'Hagan for his introductory essay, and to acknowledge the Emigrant Support Program of the Department of Foreign Affairs, as well as the help of many individ individuals in the United States, including New York University's Buxton Ireland House, Maudie Dewar, Lillian Farrell, Patricia Hardy, Carlotta Hester, Anna McGillicuddy, Chris Murray, Nuala Quinlan, and Pauline Turley. Uh, the program would also uh, I'd now like to ask Tanya Kyung and Louise Donnelly, to, uh, who are here with us from the Gallery of Photography, to please stand. Can you stand, Tanya? And, uh, and, and, and you'll be able to recognize them and you'll be able to uh, chat with them downstairs at the reception. And they also have complimentary.